Let's get into some advanced techniques here. So if you go beyond the basics of asking it what package you could use or feeding it some code of yours and asking what you could add, Let's talk about, I think, zero shot and multi -prompt, uh, multi shot prompting is a great place to start. At the core of all these models, um, it's just a transformer that like repeats the patterns it has been trained on. So if a pattern is not present in the model itself, you could tell it this is the pattern that, that I'm looking for here. And extending your prompts like that is, is simpler than most people think. So how could we integrate multi-shot prompting into advanced use cases when it comes to code generation? Yeah, it's an, um, in fact, you know, uh, few shot prompting for code generation is still an open research problem in that I, um, I don't think we really, you know, have gotten it right about like how to optimize the examples. Um, and the reason for that is because um, few shot prompting for um, previous problems, like for example, for prediction problems, has been used as a way to give different instances of exactly the same problem. In that, for example, if you are doing simply just like multiplication, then you'd give some examples of multiplication to really condition the conversation. But in this case, if you say do not know you are in the second scenario when you don't know the solution to the problem, if you knew an example about like how that would work, then you wouldn't need to generate new code, right? So this is where this, um, you know, chicken and egg problem starts with. But there are other ways, you know, how you could um, kind of blend the techniques between uh, chain of thought prompting and few shot prompting to sort of give an idea to the model of like what they could do. Say you're kind of like uh, facing a dynamic programming uh, question and you don't know exactly the solution, right? Uh, and there are many dynamic uh, programming approaches out there, but you also don't know which one of them is going to be like most um, efficient. But you want to tell the model that there are dynamic programming approaches that it could use. One idea to give a uh, few shot prompting there would be to find a similar problem, but give uh, maybe even a pseudocode solution that is not in the right um, language, but just like pseudocode on how to form dynamic programming would make the conditioning uh, work well. Or giving it, if you have implemented it in another language or you found a solution in another language and want to give it to the model so that it adapts it in another language, that could be another technique. And on top of all this, like chain of thought reasoning is something that could really help the model to pin down on the parts of the solution that are more important. But it's very important that um, that chain of thought comes before the solution itself. So this is something that is very inherent in um, these technologies in that they always feed upon what has come previously in the conversation. And that is super important. And the closer it is to the conversation, the more important it gets. So um, if we want the model to do chain of thought reasoning, that it has to be prompted so that that reason comes first and then the solution comes next. So that the reasoning impacts the um, solution. Yeah, j just if I may briefly expand on that, I think it beautifully links into what we talked about before because the conversation that you're having, it's very important to be cognizant of the fact that all that is being now stored and respected. It's like it's like bringing a new assistant into your office and then work starting to work with her. So all the work that you've done throughout the day will be stored and will be remembered. And if you open up a new chat, you basically wipe the memory, right? It's like you give the AI amnesia and you, you go you go from the beginning. And you might find that often you get very different results when you uh, send message number 15 as opposed to sending it as message number one. It's it's just a whole different conversation, right? So yeah, just, just realizing how the context works there is important. And there are results actually on how this uh, diversity of thought Ha, um, helps models with coming uh, with the right solutions. And um, so what um, I mean there is this thing like, you know, forcing the model to clear the chat in quote unquote. Yeah. So basically um, there are different ways of how to do that, like either sampling from different temperatures, um, if that variable is exposed to the user interface. And by sampling from different temperatures, you kind of like send the model into different pathways of reasoning. Um, very recently, we kind of tried a different approach where we would prompt the model with very different techniques. So the few short example there was not really an example, it was an approach, like uh, asking okay. the model use 
direct cal calculation to solve this uh, problem, or use visualization, or use a table and graphs to solve this problem. And of course, not all problems benefit from all these techniques, but when you sort of force the uh, decoding process to think about all these different ways of solving the same problem, then you enforce the diversity of thought, and then you can always ensemble these things together to, to get the right solution. Follow-up question there, Vesemira, do you use the custom instructions feature when you're using the web interface or how, you know, how, how much do you use, let's say, the, the system prompt if you're going through the API? How much information do you provide to it in advance before you even start the conversation? Because for anybody who doesn't know, you can, you can do that. You can pretty much set it up with, with um, a base with a base knowledge, right? Without even accessing external knowledge bases or anything like that. You can pretty much teach it about yourself, your approach, your preferences. Do you do that in your day-to-day -day approach? Because I certainly do. Yeah, honestly, I, I only have two of them. Like one is for just like general information. I've kind of like customized something that is more basically temperature zero and beyond so that it only gives facts uh, and doesn't get too creative with um, you know, with a generation and then just like one for code that just uh, focuses on the main um, coding problems that I work on. Um, but when it comes to, you know, experimentation for research, that is a whole, you know, completely different game in the sense that um, one needs to be uh, very specific in those instructions and even come up with these ideas that encode a diversity depending on, you know, the, the problem that we're working on. and. Um, and often I think that there is a lot to do in, um, in these UIs to make them better for customization so that users do not have to sort of like remember what they said last time and just like have them in the cache and switch back and forth um, depending on what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. the temperature obviously is a super useful one. Um, if you, you know, I, I often teach people through the web interface just because it's so user friendly mm -hmm. and there you don't really get temperature controls. But, but that's huge because you can completely eliminate, um, you know, the, the creativity there and just make it accept uh, just make it a little more down to earth. But for myself, I, I include some like interesting parts. Like for example, I like to specify um, that parts, parts to it, like priming it uh, to only give me, you know, verified data. And it obviously can't do that perfectly, but it attempts to do it. And by you telling it something like that in advance, and by you telling it in advance that, hey, every time you reference something, give me the link, it will attempt to do it. So, you know, it's kind of like a coin flip if you do that. But when doing research or when learning something new, I found it super, I found it super helpful to prime it with some of my own preferences. And, and when I'm doing research concretely for new content, I love for it to be a little more thorough. I love for it to give me a bullet point summarization at the end of every message. I love when it tries to give me the references, when it at least attempts to do it. And sometimes I even like a little summary uh, in the voice of a five-year-old, you know, at the end, just so, just like a super concise summary. So you can set it up to really fit your very own needs. Um, providing examples, let's just let's just try to let's just try to dissect that a little more because what I found in my experience is really that that is one of the the most powerful concepts you have as a user, as an end user that is trying to get something done. If you provided multiple examples specific examples of outcome that you're looking for, it will follow that closely. Like for the learning use case, right? When you're engaging in a new language or library or just trying like to explore like unexplored territory, um, there, this is not so relevant, right? But when you're extending your app, which is the other use case that you outlined, in that case, uh, where would you go? What are some places to look for examples, right? What would be some places some maybe some places across the internet where you would be looking for such examples if you're if you're developing app yeah i also wanted to add a little bit on uh, what you're saying is that um you know you're doing two things at the same time which is great like you're giving examples but you're also providing structure which is so important okay. in that like you know you're saying like this is the structure that i'm looking for in the output and this is like how the form should look like which is like super helpful for automating certain things that are maybe like repetitive. Like you wouldn't want to copy paste all those things and modify them slightly. Like you, you, you'd want the tool to do it for you. So structure is, is the other thing that goes like side by side with the examples, right? 